Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about organizations that support the deaf and hard of hearing with guests Howard Rosenblum, CEO of the National Association of the Deaf, Michelle Bronson, Executive Director of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Center in Fresno, California, and Jeffrey Brabin, Executive Director of the American School for the Deaf in West Hartford, Connecticut. And joining us are two professional interpreters, Marie Langill and Aaron Ruiz. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for, for helping us uh, um, to, to communicate. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show. We'll announce results at the bottom uh, of your screen. You'll also see uh, questions, uh, uh, Q&A function. So please submit those. We will try to get to those, uh, to those questions. So thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's just wonderful that, that you can be here and uh, help to educate someone who uh, lives in ignorance. You can, you can pull the shadow from my eyes, or at least a little bit. Um, we do know that one in five Americans are uh, deaf or hard of hearing, and that represents a total of 48 million people in this country, 48 million people. So if, if you could please give us your take on how hearing issues affect Americans of all ages, and let's start with you, Howard. That's a loaded question for sure. It's a very, very broad question, wow. Really, I think it's more about a change of perspective in society. Many just think that we need to be fixed, that a deaf of hard of hearing person isn't where they should be. But it's how do we fix society as a whole so that everyone can be included and include inclusive of deaf and hard of hearing? That's the question. We face many, many barriers right now. Um, technology awareness is evolving. It is some. It is, for example, COVID alone. Wow, so many problems have occurred because of this. You know, it's hit deaf and hard of hearing more than other. For one example, let's look at the masks, the use of masks. Wow, it's a must to protect us. Yes. Yes, we know how vitally important it is. Right, we should be using clear masks though. Then you'd be able to see the lips. Very important, hard of hearing deaf people and hearing people as well. Sometimes they have a hard time understanding because the sounds might be muffled. You know, they don't realize how much they do rely on lip reading as I'm saying hearing people. And expression is very important, but would you have a mask on, it's so difficult wear a clear mask or figure out other ways to be able to communicate during the pandemic. That's vitally important. And as you mentioned, Zoom, right now, the world has changed so much today, so much more to the virtual realm, and we wanna be inclusive. Like right now, you can see today, we have two interpreters on the Zoom with us. There's many barriers there as well, including uh, telehealth as well. Very often you wanna to go to the doctor, the patient is there in person. But now we go to see the doctor, the telehealth, where's the interpreter? That's an issue that we're facing during the pandemic. This is all new things that have come up. Now in the past, there's been so many other areas. We see solutions happening, but then new situations come up and we have to look at resolving those too. It's a never ending, you know, we're always, when will we come back to normal? We hope people are beginning to understand more in that vein. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's so important to get the message out there that there's 48 million deaf and hard of hearing people in the United States. And this is Michelle, I'd like to add. I don't think that people are always aware, or understand that the deaf and hard of hearing community has different ways of communicating as well. There are many people who use ASL, but there are also some who use PSC, which is a mixture of ASL and English. There are some who use the oral method, some who use cued speech which is a little outdated, but people still use it. And so some people also write, um, communicate with written language. There are also some people who have moved to America and may use a different sign language system. So it's important too, that we know that people don't always realize that there is diversity within the deaf and hard of hearing community. And like you mentioned masks, that is one of the biggest beefs that we've had with masks is having to be able to communicate because we do not hear and still having people talk at us 
instead of communicating with us, right? There are other ways to communicate than spoken language, whether we type back and forth or write back and forth, but people often get frustrated when we ask them to communicate in a different method. Some people are willing to gesture and write back and forth, and there are some who still aren't, but we're all adapting. I think you made such valid points, the two of you. And there are so many different kinds of deaf individuals. As Howard said, they use, and Michelle said, they use different languages. Many people, when they meet a deaf person, you know, maybe one person they met and the person was really able to hear a little bit well and able to speak well. And then they just understand that everyone, they believe that everyone is the same and that's not the truth. Someone, some deaf people can't speak, they can't, they might write well, you know, again, general as the people, as everyone out there, you know, everyone is very individualized. You call us, sometimes they call us the invisible disability, because if you walk down the street, you would not look at us and think of us as anything different. And they don't respond, we don't respond to them. They look at us in an odd way. Now, we have to look at each individual person very differently. I know through the pandemic, it's been very challenging and it has increased tremendously. So I see education is increasing as well. I see more accessibility as well. As Howard said, we must be included. Universal design is a very important word. That's used for buildings, that's used for accessibility to places. And we are building ramps for wheelchairs, don't we do that? Why not put in captions everywhere? Why not put interpreters everywhere for us? Why not allow that accessibility? You know, why everywhere we go and whatnot into a building, it would be so nice to have the same equal access as everyone else does. So we all feel the same as Americans. Um, if I could ask- Can I uh, add could... one more thing about language access? Oh. We mentioned interpreters on Zoom. And not just that, I try to explain also, Zoom has the ability to also caption. They have the auto captions. I always do that when that is available, as well as the professional captioning. That's also is available to many people that do not sign, deaf people that don't sign. So we need to see more of that happening. And Michelle saying one quick thing to add to that too. Um, and the use of pictures. I've noticed that pictures benefit everyone, no matter the language that they use. Everyone can communicate through pictures. I think oftentimes things are focused more auditorily, but pictures are also very good. Um, if you could also, um, as you describe um, ASL and, and the various acronyms for those of us who are less uh, aware, um, that would that would be helpful. Could you just talk a little bit about um, the different communication modes and languages um, that are used by uh, people who come from different eras and come from different traditions? Certainly. American Sign Language, ASL. That is the third most used language in America presently. ASL started long, long ago, even before, well, we are called the first school, deaf school in America, established 1817, but the language was established before that. It was a combination of home sign and then French, a gentleman by Lorraine Claire, who was deaf, he came here and he brought the French sign language, combination with, um, sign the home sign and Martha's Vineyards. So there's a combination of these languages became American Sign Language. There's many other types of modalities of communication as well. One is called C sign. That's a more specific sign, it's symbols with the sign. Um, another one is called Pigeon Sign Language. That's a combination of American Sign Language and English signs. There's many different modes of communica communication. There's even uh, oral visual spoken language there's cute speech. There's quite a few different languages that are used. Well, people ask what is the best? Whatever is best, as long as the child or the adult has full access to communication. If you use the modality, then you match that with them. Well, let them have full access. That's the most critical point here. And I suppose it's the matter of how people communicate with another, making sure that communication is happening. If it is clear, that makes life so much more successful. Another, as an educator that I am, I'm always saying, children, 
learn the language from age zero to eight. So we have to make sure that we provide them as much language we can as they're that, in that particular young age. So they establish the right foundation of language so that they can then proceed with a lifetime of learning after that. Right, and this is Michelle, I wanted to add. Um, ASL is the, is the natural visual language of deaf people. It is easier to acquire that language for deaf people. In terms of deaf and hard of hearing children, sorry, let me put down this poll. <laughs> It was a visual barrier. Okay, so deaf and hard of hearing people and educators and their presence and their parents are always told or, right? It's They have English and ASL instruction though. So over the years, medical professionals have always said, don't learn sign language. It will hinder your speech and language development. You need to focus on speaking and listening. But we are saying, no, we should be providing all communication access, whether that be speech therapy, having a hearing aid, getting a cochlear implant, learning ASL, they are all tools. And we need to know, right, have it be child led and know that each child is different and has different needs. I oh, absolutely agree with both those comments. At National Association for the Deaf, we want to encourage people now. I think back in the day, it was called, let me see, the Wall, War of Education Methods, speaking and he listening only or signing only. And that's a myth. We need to stop that, this saying this and arguing over that. Again, there's a continuum. There's a range of different possibilities how a child learns. The most important thing is language acquisition. Without this acquisition, a child will be forever delayed and they'll never catch up. We have to make sure from birth that these children have a language, whatever works for them, whether it be sign, whether it be listen and spoken, whatever it is, anything and everything, that is the key. And that's what many parents are not told. Many doctors, you know, when a child is born, they said, oh my goodness, you better get a cochlear implant or a hearing aid so they'll be able to hear. And the child will always be less. Now, if you look at the deaf world presently right now, we have education, we have CEOs, there's attorneys, there's over 400 lawyers, and I'm one of them, I have to add, um, over a hundred doctors. Again, the list goes on, a thousand deaf persons with PhD, and many of them use ASL and they may not speak. Howard, do you endorse Michelle's, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just one more, BASL, Black American Sign Language, and also LSM, language from Mexico. But again, we need to recognize that there's diversity again within the deaf community itself. It's just not a white deaf American. It's the diversity range all there, different cultures within the culture. There's native sign, there's different dialects, there's cultural changes within each. Altogether, that's what makes up deaf culture as a whole. You're making such an important point about this is simply linguistic. If we think about linguistic too often as being the thing that comes out of one's mouth, but it could also come out of one's hand, right? Um, and and if, we are, if we're talking about the third largest language group in the United States, and we care about involving all citizens because the country is stronger when all citizens can contribute, then to uh, not um, allow or create impediments to the communication of the third largest language group in the United States seems incredibly foolish. Um, Howard, I was going to ask whether you endorse Michelle's um, statement, uh, which I hope I understand properly, Michelle, is that um, these are just all tools. And so looking at tools neutrally and without judgment and just saying every individual can self-select which tools and collection of tools and which dialects and, and uh, cross-dialectical uh, discussions they wish to have, do you, do you endorse that, so, that whole philosophy of, of just sort of, here's what we can do? Choose. Um, I support making sure the parents are aware of all of these options and to try all instead of saying, just pick one because the doctor told me to. Very often they say, wow, if you teach your child sign language, they're never gonna learn how to speak. 
And that's another myth. Many, many children, including myself, learned how to speak and how we did it through sign language and speech therapy. Before sign speech therapy, I would sit in a room with a speech therapist who didn't sign and they would just mouth the words repeatedly to me, dog, as an example, all day long, repeating the word dog. That was a word I didn't understand. But luckily my mother was a teacher and she said, hmm, that age is ripe for the brain. It's like a sponge right now. Language acquisition occurs now and it wasn't happening. So we transferred to a different speech therapist who signed and they would show me and be able to describe to me through sign and I was able to correctly mouth the word, speak the word. So there is a myth that if you teach a child to sign, it's gonna spoil or corrupt or interfere with a deaf child's education and they'll become to become quote, normal. There is no quote, normal anymore. Every individual is their own person. Let them be themselves. Right, and Michelle saying, I'd like to add to what Howard just said. I think it's ironic that hearing parents teach hearing babies how to sign, right? Baby sign language is so popular right now. And they say it's wonderful for brain development, all of that. But hearing parents of deaf children are told not to teach their children sign language because it will hinder language development. That's the same as my experience. As soon as I got a speech, that had a speech therapist who could sign and was able to explain how things were pronounced, it was so much less frustrating. It was so frustrating when I had a speech therapist who didn't know sign language. Going to school with different, learning different concepts and all of that was so important. And that, right, education is more than just learning how to pronounce a word. It is so important, right? And again, like you talked about, it's all back to language and linguistics. I want to add at the same time, at American School for the Deaf here, we do all offer both spoken English and sign. We use what's called a bilingual approach. We use sign and English. English, how do we do that? Is through listening, of course. So we, it's through writing and visual. So we're allowing opportunities for the child. Some are going to thrive with one particular method. Then maybe the learning how to listen and to speak might not work for them where ASL will. But the bottom line is that it doesn't matter which road or method of communication. Key is parents' involvement. That makes a huge difference. I can't impress that enough. If you involve parents, the more they're involved with their child, the more successful they will be. It doesn't matter which communication mode they may pick. So one of the um, one of the really interesting aspects here is this idea of language. And I have to say the deaf community is not special in the aspect of being confused by the advice of experts on this topic. Um, I grew up in multilingual environments and we were constantly hearing criticism of, of uh, educating children in more than one language. Uh, saying that this would confuse the child and it would retard their development and, and all this other uh, stuff, which people who grow up in multilingual environments know is just, it's not true. Uh, and quite the opposite, it actually helps in, in their intellectual uh, development. Um, and, and so this whole idea of what is speech, I mean, to me, you look all to be very articulate I just can't understand without an interpreter. Um, and I can see the different styles. I can see the different expressions. I'm, I'm just endlessly, endlessly fascinated by this, but I see in your speech, this incredible articulate expression. I just can see it instead of hear it. I have to help someone to understand, uh, to have me understand it. Um, I wanna ask some questions about um, adults. And in particular, the whole idea of having uh, adults who are um, capable of being attorneys and capable of, of uh, running businesses and um, making the normal adult contributions and how uh, those impediments that society has uh, keeps us away from those uh, talented individuals in a way that somebody who might speak Spanish um, might not have an impediment. So can we talk about how um, work for workplaces uh, can adjust to take advantage of people who cannot communicate with others through 
oral communications, a small business like, like ours, which is dedicated to serving organizations like yours, we don't quite know where to start. So if you could provide us with some, some help in navigating that, how can we do this? We cannot afford to have a full, full-time interpreters and so on. How does that, how can that function for, for small and large businesses? Uh, Michelle, do you want to give a give a first cut, and then we can go to uh, Jeffrey and then Howard? Sure. Um, we are a community benefit organization, and we do employment assistance and employment placement. That is a common question of employers. How are we going to afford interpreters? And there are a variety of ways. So some strategies is to use the smartphone, right? You can type back and forth, depending on what that is and what the location and where the placement is. Um, you can text back and forth, or you can say, hey, I need you to go over to this location or go do this, right? Those simple types of communications can be text. You can also have a picture guide, um, at, depending on what the job is. Just really making sure that each facility is accessible visually, if they have flashing fire alarms, having a video phone installed. Video phones are free, so the employer or an employee just need to coordinate the installment of that technology. When you think about communication, oftentimes people think about verbal communication, right? And they think, oh, well, you can't speak on the phone, but we do have telephone access. So really about changing the terminology at the place of employment. Oftentimes people at the co-workers will learn sign language and really they a lot of things are visual and processes can be shown visually you can gesture there are so many people though who are afraid to gesture or even use the few signs that they may know so we always say if you know it please use it if you know the alphabet in asl please use that with us we will find ways to communicate with people if it is a large meeting or something like that, of course, an interpreter would be required if it's something that's giving a lot of information or if it has a large attendance, but something one-on-one -on -one may be able to be modeled. You can text, you can write back and forth. There are other strategies and it just depends on the person's preferences. I wanna say technology has so changed the lives of deaf people overall and will continue to do so. It's just totally, it's an amazing tool you, people don't realize how much it can do. Right now you have apps. You can take the person's voice and it changes to captions on the app. So that way you can respond through typing back. There's something called video relay interpreting service. Maybe you're not familiar with that particular thing. It means the same thing right now we're doing right now. The interpreter is speaking through me. And again, when the person is looking, now I'll call to another interpreter might be remotely. Once that's done, we could speak to the person and we can sign on my phone and I can watch it that way. We go back and forth and it's very effective. There's a different range of things we can do with technology. Some are cost per minute, some are cost per hour through video relay. You don't have to interpreter, have an interpreter with you all day. You don't need to do that. So that's the kind of technology use that we're seeing today that's improving the lives of us. It's a matter of knowing what is available out there to be able to help people be able to gain accessibility to what they need. I'm going to share a result, uh, Howard, just real quickly, because this, this is interesting in that we just took this poll and we found that the two greatest challenges for those who are deaf and hard of hearing are attitudes and behaviors of people like myself. Uh, uh, who, is, who is not deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and also uh, that American businesses are not designed uh, to, um, to accommodate and integrate um, the third largest language group in the country. So sorry for interrupting Howard, I just thought it would be uh, interesting to just share that. Oh, that's fine. I can tell you. Right now, I'm in almost my 30 years as an attorney, and I've been involved with litigations against people, employees that are not providing clients the service. I see it happen very often. There's many are well-intentioned. They want to do the right thing. It's very important to have the dialogue with the deaf and hard of hearing person. 
both the employer and them. Find out what their needs are. Both people mentioned tools. Understanding, we can't say, okay, well, I know about this particular cool tool and I'm gonna use that blanketly across for everyone. No, you need to communicate to make sure you're fitting someone's needs. We talked about video relay service. It is a free service. You know, person that person can call and you can make the call with their boss or with a co-worker or you can use, you know, this system and then interpreter provided in the phone system that's paid by the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC. There's no cost at all to be able to provide that service. That's for a deaf phone call only. Now in person, yes, you do have to pay for the interpreter. That's a little bit different. Understand those two examples are good for people that use American Sign Language, ASL. For deaf and hard of hearing people that do not use that modality of communication, maybe they would prefer to see captioning. Understand it's also an equality version on the phone. That is free as well. It's paid by the FCC. But again, if you want in-person captioning, you can do. It's a free auto captioning option that they have. Now, if it's something, a meeting that's very important, they're gonna be using specific terminology, the automatic captioning is not gonna capture that. That's when you need to have a professional captioning services. There are many options, but again, my most important thing I would say is ask the deaf and hard of hearing person what they need. Right, and this is Michelle. For effective communication, it means making sure to meet everyone where they're at and what their communication needs are. It's based on that person and what their needs are. So we're coming to the end of our time. I'd, I'd like to go around the room um, very briefly, um, and I will announce the results of this uh, last poll, which is uh, where people get information, uh, because there are three organizations that we're talking to right now who can provide that information. But where people get their information today is really important. Um, so let's go around the room. Uh, let's start uh, with you, Jeffrey. Um, could you talk about um, what actions somebody like I can take um, uh, to try and improve things? Um, if, if you were going to pick one or two things that you would like me to do after the show, and I know one already, so you can't use that. I'm going to actually ask you for help in uh, forming recommendations for improving Zoom communications uh, in this way. So you can't use that. Um, but if you can give me one or two things that I can do going forward to make things better. First, I would say, like Michelle said, ask the person that you're with, ask them what they want. And what the person wants, that's the best solution. Some people assume, well, I'll do this particular thing. And I'm believing that that's providing access, but that's not, as I said before, every individual is very different. So just go ahead and ask them or involve them in the discussion. Involve a few members within the community have an open discussion with them, and that will give you a better, broader picture. We, almost every state now has a school for the deaf. I know that some state governments have a commissioner on the deaf and hard of hearing service. It's a wonderful people, and they'll certainly help guide you the best way to become inclusive. And I, but I'm gonna go back right now to universal design. How we as a community, as a state, as a country have transformed so that now that we are all accessible to all individuals, that's what we want, regardless of ethnic background, of language, of communication modality. Again, again, we will continue to collaborate and that's how we do. That's what I dream for everyone is full communication and access for all. And Michelle? Yes, um, for me, two quick comments. Just to be aware of what the unconscious bias is for deaf and hard of hearing, for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Oftentimes people say, oh, I accept everyone. But oftentimes we'll recognize and see that, that pity, quote unquote, right? Like, oh, you're deaf, oh, you're not the same. But we are the same. We just use a different way to communicate. We are adults, we function in society, we provide and contribute back to society just as all other adults do. So please just remove that unconscious bias and also not to assume that everyone can lip read, right? We say, can you, cause you're hearing, can you play the piano? 
right? Maybe not. And so I often assume that just because you're deaf, you can lip read. So I think that will make sure to decrease the amount of um, frustration for us. That's too such good advice that you gave. You know, if you need resources, you can contact us. There's organizations in every state, except Wyoming. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet, and we're working on that. But again, go ahead and reach out. I do want to add something. Any nonprofit or any business or any organization, we should always make sure that all the contents are posted online and should be accessible. That means if you have a video, add captions to it. That's not difficult to do and it's not expensive. Anyone can do that. So we encourage that as part of what Jeff said regarding the universal design. And if you could have someone sign the content, that would be even better. But captioning would be the minimum. Again, what Michelle said, don't assume anything about the person. Know that they are the same as you and they're as equal to you. It means we can, I can explain how many times I've gone into court and I've told the judge and explained to him and the lawyer said, wait a minute, well, who's represents you? And I'm like, no one's representing me. I'm representing them. They just assume that I have to be the plaintiff or the defendant, that I'm not the attorney. This has happened numerous amount of times. So it's going back to the assumptions and the biases that we as deaf people cannot, but we can just give us that chance. Michelle saying, right. And, and our, um, our third poll actually endorses the fact of the invaluable service uh, that people feel that uh, uh, is provided by uh, nonprofits like yours. 39% said that their basic information on uh, people who are deaf hearing come from nonprofits like yours. But what was interesting to me is that is the endorsement of your statement about the fact that uh, people really um, are somewhat exposed to uh, others who are deaf or hard of hearing through family and friends. And 29% uh, uh, of the people said, I have a family uh, member uh, or, or friend who, who, um, who uh, is deaf or hard of hearing. Um, this idea of being one American family and thinking about bridging our differences in language uh, is so important to inclusiveness. And I'd like to thank you all for, for providing us with a window that can illuminate, if opened, our ignorance and make that ignorance uh, into changed uh, behavior. Uh, Howard Rosenblum, CEO of the National Association for the Deaf. Michelle Bronson, Executive Director of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Center in Fresno. And Jeffrey Braven, Executive Director of the American School for the Deaf in West Hartford. And I'd like to also very specially thank um, our interpreters, Marie Langell and Aaron Ruiz, um, the idea of acting as a facilitator uh, for all of us so that we can uh, together share is so important. It's such a matter of heart. Uh, thank you both also for, for helping us. So many thanks. That's the nonprofit report. I'm sure uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, sending emails back and forth. Uh, attendees, thank you for coming. Uh, please forgive uh, our deficiencies. Let's, let's become better in the future. And uh, we'll see you again on Tuesday. Take care. Stay safe all.